Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today, I am really excited to introduce you to Ryan Kirk and his amazing book called Relentless Souls. And just by the title, it's everything that you expect it to be. Hi, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, my pleasure. Relentless Souls, two brothers, Rights, monks, orders, customs, betrayal. How'd you come up with it? Um, I had actually just come off of another fantasy series, and I had, was just obsessed with the idea of the idea of two brothers and how their relationship would grow in time and actually beyond the barriers of death. I thought that was a really interesting concept. And I wanted to run with it. You definitely ran with that. <laughs> it was such a good, warm opening. And then you had that that undercurrent of darkness <laughs> starts to creep in. It almost mm -hmm. sneaks up on you the way you did it. It was so <laughs> enjoyable to read. And then just traveling through their world and being possessed in a good way. That was really interesting spin. I just love how that all came about and how all these relationships develop along the way. The one guy that I couldn't like was Fang. <laughs> like I just couldn't find it any in my heart at all. He was just so evil. You love to hate him all the way through the <laughs> book. It was like, really? Wow. <laughs> um, but it was so good. I really enjoyed reading it. It kept me up into the middle of the night. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. So <laughs> tell me how you did it. How did all these elements come together for you? Yeah. So uh, as I talked about, the initial idea was that idea of the relationship between two brothers and continuing uh, beyond death. I think that we always have this uh, kind of trope in our society that a possession is always a bad thing. And so I was really curious if we just turn that on its head a little bit. And what would it be like if uh, possession was more of a force for good? Something that was trying to convince an otherwise uh, roguish young man that there were things uh, greater than himself worth fighting for. And so I thought that was really, really interesting. And then uh, the character that you love to hate, uh, Fang, I just got really interested in the idea of how um, an overwhelming belief can either be a force for good or it can also corrupt and cause people to do very evil things that are really hard to sympathize with. Yeah, and just the way he got sucked into that being more evil than he could have been on his own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was really well done. And there were points where you, you found out things about him, and you're like, okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, I'm not going to like him. Still not going to like him. Oh, my gosh. It mm -hmm. was amazing. And, you know, you just... You wanted to feel bad for the guy in some way, but there's mm -hmm. just, it was just not happening. But in a good way, in a good way that it made you chase the story more because you wanted to find, you know, that area of, you know, like, could you forgive somebody for things? And Yeah, and I find that to be, <clears throat> it's a really interesting conflict because, 
his past and the things that happened to him, uh, they certainly don't excuse his behavior. Like they certainly don't make him likable or sympathetic. But at the same time, my hope is that it at least provides a reason. I don't tend to, I tend to be an optimist about human nature. And I think that we make a lot of mistakes, but I think that very few people are naturally evil. And so yeah, trying to trying to figure out how he would become the man who would do the things that he would do was an interesting problem to solve. Yeah, and it was it was just great those conflicts that you developed along the way where we're like under other circumstances could I be friends with this guy? Mm. You know. <laughs> And then you're like, yeah, no. It was, it was like such a good tug of war the way you developed it. I really well, enjoyed thank it. Thank you. Thank you. And for what it's worth, I don't think I'd want to be friends with him either. You don't think what? I don't think I would want to be friends with him either. He, uh, not very yeah. much fun to hang out with. No, I mean, he'd probably be somebody good to spar with, <laughs> but mm -hmm. he'd be a challenge. But <laughs> man, no. <laughs> I don't know. But it really, I think the way that you wrote it, um, it helps people make sense of things. You know, mm. it like gives you a good way of looking at things that go terribly wrong in the world. And mm -hmm. that it's, you know, okay, like people, horrible, some horrible things happen. Yeah, and I'm really glad that you said that. I feel like that is something that I hope to achieve at least in small part with everything that I write. Um, I think that it's, it's very easy to make life simpler than it actually is. And I feel like the best way to get into some of that understanding is to spend hundreds of pages with a character that you probably would not hang out with in your local bar. Right. <laughs> well, do, do you travel a lot? Because it seemed like there's a lot of influence from different cultures i mean from the monks mm -hmm. to the different rites orders the landscapes were amazing but mm -hmm. and you didn't have to go into a lot of detail to bring us into these really unique places but i love the way that all played out so do you travel well, a lot thank you yeah i have been uh, very fortunate that i've been able to do a lot of traveling around the world and it has definitely influenced my writing because um, you know fantasy and fairy tales they're they're like the ultimate escape story and it's kind of nice because you can do that in real life just by going someplace else and I've had the opportunity to travel to a fair number of countries and I'm very grateful for that well oh, that's great it definitely influences the way you lay out the story and the way that it we can you bring it to life in such a vivid way without going into crazy details. Uh, thank you. I um, no. I was inspired a lot with I was inspired a lot with the uh, monasteries. In one of my travels, I actually had an opportunity to go to Japan and spend some time on Mount Koyasen, which is Japan's holy mountain. Mm -hmm. And so I had the opportunity to actually um, spend a few nights at the monasteries there and just take part in their daily routine, which was something that I was able to take parts of uh, back into the story. So that was really fun. Definitely. The layout of the monasteries and the stories was completely believable. And mm. having traveled... I thought I recognized some places <laughs> here and there along the way. Mm -hmm. um, how, what other factors influenced it? Was Because there seems to be like a little bit of, is it Amni? I can never pronounce it. A-N-I-M-E. <laughs> Anime, yep. Anime. Yes, there was. When I was trying to imagine the conflicts and the fight scenes between the characters. I <clears throat> was actually inspired by a few of the more popular anime series. Um, and 
there are several of them, but one that is probably most recognizable is the Dragon Ball world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it was such a, it's such a visual medium. It was fun to try and bring that, some of that to the written word. Is this your first novel or have you written many before? <laughs> no, this is uh, not my first novel. I uh, have written, this was novel 12. <laughs> 12? Oh, you can definitely tell because it's so <laughs> well done. Oh, well, thank you very much. And what about the magic involved? Mm. How does that work? Do you have strict concrete rules or is there a specific set of rules that you follow? Um, so when the series starts, it did start out with a pretty strict set of rules. But another one of the ideas that really seized me when I was writing was the idea that these monks don't understand the magic that they're using. And I think I was actually inspired by that because I was reading an article about um, the percentage of people who understand actually how a computer works. Okay. And it's just something that we use every day. It's a piece of technology that is a part of our lives. And yet the percentage of a population that could actually build a computer is really, really slim. And I applied that same idea to magic in this world where you have all of these people who can use this magic power and perhaps they think they understand it, but there's actually much more underneath the surface than what they understand. And they're just starting to realize that. I like how that came out and the nature elements. So is nature important mm -hmm. to how you write these? Yeah, absolutely. I grew up actually in a rural town in North Dakota. And so I was very fortunate in that I got to spend a lot of time outdoors growing up, a lot mm -hmm. of time camping, a lot of time hiking. And it's still something that I really, really like to do. And it's really important to me that in my stories that a lot of these characters spend a lot of their lives out in nature and are really connected to nature and not disconnected the way that <clears throat> a lot of us are in cities these days. Definitely. No, nope, it was a great tale. I loved the way that it flowed. I loved all the elements that brought it together. I love to hate Fang. <laughs> <laughs> It was great. I mean, you really were great about pulling emotions out, you know, and sucking us into reading in the middle of the <laughs> night. I think one day I was up till 4 a.m. <laughs> uh, I am sorry, but thank you. Oh, thank you. I was just like, oh, I have to find out what happens next. Wait, <laughs> just another chapter. And then I looked at the clock like, oh, really? <laughs> but it was so much fun to read. And it was just really absorbing. And it's thick enough, you know, that it would take, you know, a day or two to read. Like, well, if mm -hmm. you didn't go crazy like I did, but <laughs> if you can, like, pace yourself. Uh, it was a lot of fun to write as well. I can imagine. How did you keep track of the characters and the elements? Because those are really consistent throughout. And the magic the way that it worked or, you know, one side understood something and another side understood something else? Um, yeah, that was actually a very difficult problem for me to solve. And uh, even though there are technology solutions for such problems, I am a little bit old fashioned. And so I actually used a notebook. <laughs> really? Yeah, I actually have it right here. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just dozens and dozens of pages of handwritten notes and reminders to myself and, uh, yeah, an you, index that I could refer to. <laughs> seriously? Do you like put stuff on the wall, have sticky notes? You know, I don't, I sometimes wish that I did. I think it'd be really cool and I could take fun pictures up about it. 
Um, but I've always just preferred notebooks just because then everything's always in one place. And yeah, every time I write any note down on a piece of paper, it goes into the index for the notebook so I can find it again later. Uh, wow. <laughs> I don't know how you did it, but, and I like the way that the higher ideals that came through mm. the book where it wasn't, and it, it was dealing with monks. So you would think it would come across as preachy, but it doesn't mm. at all. It's just woven in like just hints at it along the way. And you totally no. grasp it by the end. Thank you. Yeah. I, I like having my stories try to be about something that's important. And it's usually a question that I'm wrestling with myself. And there were a few of them in this book, like uh, what role should belief play? Because on one hand, you've got the monks and on the other hand, you've got Fang and they both believe that they're right and they're fighting each other and killing each other and innocents are being harmed. And so it was this, it was an opportunity for me to explore uh, and try and figure out an answer to the question. Wow. So I guess you're one of those people who believes this world still needs heroes. <laughs> I do. I am actually absolutely fascinated by heroes. I think that perhaps the heroes that consume a lot of our media, like, uh, you know, Captain America and Superman, um, I think they can be useful, but... I think one of the things that I'm really glad is that we live in a time where more of our stories are more complex. And so we have more complex heroes that maybe aren't perfect. And I think that is an important distinction to make. We often think about just heroes, but we forget about heroic acts. That, um, yeah, that's or that, that you're, I'm fascinated by. You're forced into it or you stumble upon it so that mm -hmm. you have to, you know, you have to finish something and you become the mm -hmm. unexpected hero. Mm -hmm. The way that these twists came out in this story was just, it was really amazing storytelling. I can't wait to read more. <laughs> well, thank you. I'd be happy to send you the others too. Oh, I, okay. I want them. <laughs> <laughs> done and done. Yeah, I'll be like up for a weekend reading them all. They're <laughs> so enjoyable. So what were the first 12 about? Um, so the very first books that I wrote, uh, they're called the uh, Nightblade series. And that story talks about um, a divided kingdom that used to be one, but was divided by civil war. And it was divided because of the magical users in the kingdom who are known as Nightblades. And so the Nightblades have been outlawed from the kingdom. If they're found, they are getting involved in a uh, long running battle for the fate of the kingdom. Wow, that must be intriguing <laughs> too. I can imagine you wrestling with a several different moral issues along the way. Mm -hmm. You're really good at bringing those into the storyline. Yeah. Do you do that in every book you write? I try to. <laughs> I don't know how successful I am with every attempt, but I continue to try, and hopefully it gets better with every attempt. And what is the magic of reading stories out loud? Mm. This is something that I've only discovered recently because I am a big fan of a nice thick paperback book still or hardcover. I'm not, I'll do either. But I, uh, a couple of years ago was spending a lot of time on the road and started listening to audio stories. And about the same time I had a young baby girl who was born. Oh, congratulations. Uh, thank you. And uh, as part of that, as somebody attempting to be a good parent, I have read her a lot of stories. And what I've learned is that 
there is an art to written storytelling, but there is an art to oral storytelling as well. And sometimes they line up and sometimes they don't, but being able to sit down and to tell a good story or to listen to a good story uh, through the magic of just speaking and listening has really changed my perspective on storytelling. When I talk with, I will, like my daughter is three, she can't read yet, Mm -hmm. but she's read stories, she's had stories read often enough to her that she can flip through the pages and tell her own story. And sometimes it lines up with the words in the book and sometimes it doesn't, but it's always, like it's always a story and you can see that even at such a young age, she's starting to understand kind of how important story is to her and that wouldn't be unlocked yet for her if she wasn't able to listen to stories. Oh, that is true. <laughs> and that, what about the idea behind magic that it can change mm. and grow? Do you equate it with people changing and growing? Mm-hmm. How does that play out in your writing? Um, so this is not necessarily a new idea in fantasy. I know that other writers have done this as well. Um, but I think all too often when we look at fantasy, we tend to think of magic as almost equivalent to modern day physics. It has rules that need to be followed and, um, perhaps we don't understand the system completely, but there are rules in place that the system has to follow whether they're discovered or not. Mm -hmm. And that is one fun way to approach magic, but I like looking at magic as though it were another character in the story and a story where a character doesn't change unless you're James Bond. It's probably not a very exciting story. And the same for me holds true with the magic, just that uh, if magic is truly magic, it can change and adapt as the world that it's a part of evolves. And so I really like the idea of having magic systems that change and grow, and maybe the rules aren't as set in stone as we would like to think. Yeah, I like how that played out in this book. And it was more going the other way towards finding the source Mm-hmm. and how something developed so it could be adapted or, you know, acknowledge that something could even be adaptable. Mm-hmm. I just love how you brought out all those type of issues throughout the whole novel. And it was fast paced. There was action. It was creative. The results weren't something that you would expect. You were mm-hmm. great at bringing us into a plot and just like, Ah, you know, <laughs> and, and, and evil, the evilness in the book was like, wow. Like, he really drove uh, me crazy. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I just, glad, actually, you know. He was a, a bad, like the villain that you really are <laughs> like, I hate him. <laughs> a villain that gets under your skin is a good villain. <laughs> yeah, no, exceptional writing. Really exceptional writing, storytelling, and the way that it all twisted together. So enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So what's your best advice to young people that Mm want to release their first novel? Mm. I think that I would have two pieces. And that is, the first one is to read a lot and write a lot. and writing is a lot like any other skill it is something that is not probably going to be easy at first it certainly was not for me it still isn't sometimes and so the more you practice hopefully the better that you get at it and the second piece of advice would maybe be the hardest and it's to simply be patient uh writing anything from a short story to a poem to a book 
can take an enormous amount of time to get right. And it's okay to be patient and to let that time elapse. Wow. And how long have you been writing for? I have been able to make my living as a full-time writer for five years now. Wow. But I've been, I've been writing for most of my life. <laughs> That's fantastic. And Relentless Souls is such a great read. Really, well, really enjoyed you. it. Thanks for sharing so much about your stories and the way that these characters developed and the world around them. It was really well, interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. This has been a really fun conversation. Oh, my pleasure. Till next time, keep asking questions. <laughs> and if you're looking for a really interesting author who will drag you along an awesome storyline, Ryan Kirk and Relentless Souls is definitely a great place to start. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure.